Welcome everyone to Dynamic Seating, providing movement for clinical benefit. This new motion course will address this practice area and intervention. Thanks for joining us here today. My name is Michelle Lang. I'm an occupational therapist in the Denver, Colorado area. I do use dynamic seating quite a bit with the clients that I work with uh, to their clinical benefit, I hope. And again, I hope this information will be helpful to you. So we have the following learning objectives for this course. It is approved for CEUs. The participant will be able to list clinical indicators for dynamic seating, three of them, list three areas of movement provided by dynamic seating, list one product option for a dynamic back, dynamic footrest, and dynamic head support hardware. So this is what we will cover in this course today. We're going to discuss just what is dynamic seating? How do we define this? What are the clinical indicators? Who can benefit from dynamic seating interventions? And then finally, we're going to review some specific product options so that you can match product parameters with specific client need. Here is our definition, not only for the purpose of this course, but also this is a formal definition that was developed for a recent Resna position paper on this intervention of dynamic seating. A, a large international work group actually developed consensus on this very definition. So here it is. Dynamic seating is movement which occurs within the seating system and or wheelchair frame in response to intentional or unintentional force generated by the client. Dynamic components absorb those forces and return energy to assist the client back to a starting position. Now, dynamic seating has sometimes been used to refer to other products or processes that are related to wheelchair seating and mobility, anywhere from air cushions to a change of pressure that occurs between a cushion and the client during self-propulsion. So it's important to make sure that we're clear about what we're referring to with this technology. So dynamic seating provides movement in a number of areas. There's three main areas. First, we have movement at the hips. So movement which occurs within the seating system or the wheelchair frame that occurs at the hips generally into extension as we see here. And this is referred to as a dynamic back. Now that force might originate elsewhere like at the feet, but the movement that occurs is into hip extension. Dynamic seating can also provide movement at the legs. And this movement may be into knee extension, like we see here on the right side. It could be a telescoping downward motion. And these are called dynamic footrest. Dynamic seating can also provide movement at the head. So this movement may be into more of a neck extension type of movement, either moving the head directly rearward or into hyperextension, which we actually want to avoid. And that would use a single axis hardware or also accommodate neck rotation. And this requires multi-axis hardware. And these are called dynamic head support hardware. Now dynamic seating can capture that intentional or unintentional force. Here on the left, we see someone who is displaying an intentional rocking movement and the dynamic back is responding. On the right, we have a client who is demonstrating extension and dystonic movements. Some of these can be triggered intentionally, but oftentimes are unintentional. And the system, in this case, a dynamic back and dynamic footrest are responding to these forces generated by the client. So whether the forces are intentional or unintentional, these forces activate the dynamic component. The dynamic component then absorbs these forces that are exerted by the client and that energy is stored within the component 
and assist the client back to upright. Again, this is part of our definition. So the dynamic component may be an elastomer, a spring, a hydraulic. These are the three most common mechanisms used in dynamic seating. And again, the force from the client actually compresses the elastomer, the spring, or the hydraulic. It absorbs that force, stores that energy, kind of gets back to physics, and then that stored energy helps the client to return to their upright and neutral position as the forces are reduced. It's also important that the dynamic component do this without a loss of client position. So again, the dynamic components absorb force, return energy to assist the client back to their starting position, but we want to make sure that when the client returns to their starting position that they haven't lost some of that position. So for example, with a dynamic back, if the client is extending at the hips, we want to make sure as the client goes back to upright that the hip remains in neutral. The pelvis does, that it hasn't collapsed into a posterior pelvic tilt. So the design of the component itself is very important in returning the client to a neutral starting position rather than resulting in a loss of position like collapsing into a posterior pelvic tilt. And so the pivot points become very, very important. The pivot point of the dynamic seating component is trying to follow the natural pivot point anatomically on the client. So in this picture here, we have a dynamic back and the dynamic back starts movement quite a ways up. It starts about the level of the cushion of this molded seating system. It's very important that the pivot point is this high, otherwise as a client returned to neutral, they'd be likely to collapse into a posterior pelvic tilt. So that's some more about the definition of dynamic seating. But what are the clinical indicators? Who can benefit from this technology? Well, there are three main advantages to using dynamic seating. First is to absorb and diffuse those forces from the client. By doing so, we're protecting the client from injury and we're protecting equipment from damage. These are very common concerns in some of our clients with very high tone or large movements. Second, we're providing movement and that provides sensory input for the client and there's many clinical benefits of that. Finally, we can use dynamic seating to improve, actually make changes to postural control, stability and function. Let's look a little more specifically. Here are a number of very specific applications that fall under these three categories. Again, we're protecting the wheelchair user from injury. We're protecting the wheelchair and seating hardware from breakage. But by providing this movement and absorbing these forces, we're also increasing sitting tolerance and compliance for many clients. The client may simply be able to sit for a longer period of time. It may be that they have less pain and discomfort. We can also enhance vestibular input by providing that sensory input. And by providing enhanced vestibular input, we can see other benefits. We're facilitating some active range of motion. Instead of the client maintaining a very static posture, there's actually some movement occurring at some of the joints. This movement often leads to an increase in alertness and a decrease in agitation, and that can be very helpful for our clients. We also may see that some clients have decreased fatigue as movement, again, can increase general alertness. And many people using dynamic seating may see an improvement in their functional abilities. Providing movement against resistance can increase muscle strength and postural control, which is a very exciting area of this intervention. And because we're diffusing these forces from the client, we may see reductions in overall extension for the client and as a result, a reduced amount of energy consumption. So let's review those primary clinical scenarios again diffusing force. So here we have a young man who has a lot of force. 
and his dynamic back and dynamic footrests are absorbing some of that force and then returning him to upright when he relaxes and uh, that force is not continued against the dynamic component. If these forces were not diffused, this could lead to injury to this client, equipment breakage, and we've all seen clients who have broken their equipment because of these forces, uh, decreased sitting tolerance, increased agitation, decreased function, further increase in extension as this young man would collide with a static non-yielding surface and energy consumption. Now he's still moving around, but the seating system is now moving with him and that leads to these clinical benefits. He tolerates the seating system far better than he did his static system. Our other primary clinical scenario is providing movement. Allowing movement provides sensory input and this as a result can increase alertness and decrease agitation. This gentleman here was very agitated at times in his static seating system as he attempted to rock, but the seating system did not move with him. He really enjoys this movement and it increases his alertness and decreases his agitation. Our other clinical scenario, our primary one, is to improve postural control, stability, and function. Uh, this woman has a dynamic back. When she is outdoors particularly and pushing her manual wheelchair against resistance, such as when she gets to the lawn here, you can see her lean back into that dynamic back and use the stored energy to help her propel the chair forward. Using this dynamic back has increased her muscle strength and postural control, but it's also improved her ability to push over varied surfaces. Again, from this angle, go ahead and take a look. She often is leaning back and then she's using that force to assist her to push the wheels as she maneuvers on this varied terrain. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the product options that are available. Again, we want to keep an eye on what are the features of these various product options and how do we best match them to our client's needs. So let's start with dynamic backs. In this case, movement only occurs at the back, though a dynamic back can be combined with other dynamic options, such as dynamic footrests, dynamic head support hardware, to provide movement in all of these areas. When determining where do we provide that movement, it does often require some time on the mat table to get a good sense of where are these forces originating from. It might be that most of the force is coming from the hip, Perhaps most of the force is coming from the lower extremities or the feet leveraging off the foot plates. In that case, we may want to look at dynamic footrests instead, but by combining these technologies, sometimes we can get a better result if we're noticing force initiated in a number of locations. Here are the companies that currently make dynamic backs in the United States. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at each of these. First is Legero. They have an option called the Dyno and it includes activator dynamic seating. And uh, again, this is available in the US. There's also an option to provide some knee extension in about 10 degrees, but the seat to back angle will open 30 degrees. There are springs on the back and there are three different options for springs so that you can choose the level of resistance that works best for the client that you are working with. One of the nice things about this system is it folds. Folding is something that often is not possible when using a dynamic back. Now this is obviously an adaptive stroller and will not meet all of our clients positioning needs. As this back is extended, you can see that the rear portion, the posterior portion of the seat is raising and that's in an effort to keep the alignment of the pelvis throughout the movement of the dynamic component. It works similarly 
to an older, now discontinued dynamic option, the Kids Rock. Miller's Adaptive Hardware has a number of dynamic products, and this is their dynamic backrest interface. It extends at the level of a biangular back. This is very important because we're trying to keep the pivot point higher up so that the client will maintain the position of their pelvis. So you can see that the lower portion remains in a static position and only the upper piece moves. Now this does require a biangular back to use this hardware. The back extends about 40 degrees. It does lock out as needed and it comes with a 20 pound gas spring, which is how much force is required to uh, compress this spring. They have a newer dynamic back option called their dynamic back cane interface. This is uh, much smaller and can be used with a uh, wider variety of commercially available backs. It's angle adjustable, so it can start off at 90, 100, or 110 degrees of seat to back angle. It comes with either 60, 80, or 120 pound gas struts, and that determines how much resistance is required, uh, how much force is required of the client actually to overcome the resistance of the hydraulic. Now, some folks will say, if the client weighs a certain amount, you should get a certain level of resistance for them. The challenge is that many people, particularly clients with increased muscle tone, may not weigh very much, but may be able to exert extreme forces. And so it's important to determine what is the very best resistance for that individual based on much more than their weight. So this opens at the hip to about 30 degrees. You can limit it as needed to either zero to 15 degrees or 15 to 30. If this person needs to start with a more open seat to back angle, by reducing the amount of movement at the hips, we're reducing shear forces. PDG has a manual chair called the Bentley, and it's a tilt and space chair. It's a very durable chair. It has an option of these springs that you can see behind the back canes, and they absorb some of the forces that the client may exert throughout uh, the seating system, uh, primarily of hip extension. And again, these are only available on the Bentley. Seating Dynamics has this dynamic back. Uh, it's called the Dynamic Rocker Back Interface and resistance is adjustable through a set of elastomers. There are four different choices. The chair comes with all four so that if one of these is not appropriate for an individual, you can easily swap it out until you find the optimal level of resistance. You can see the pivot point starts uh, rather high up, again, in an effort to minimize loss of position of the client. Uh, on the left here, you can see it is in the locked position or unlocked. Many dynamic backs have a lockout. The main application for this is transportation. If someone is being transported within the chair, we lock out the back to rigidize it so there's not excessive movement in um, transportation. Most of the time, you're going to leave this unlocked so the client can move readily. Here on the left, you'll see a demonstration of this dynamic back. You can see that little elastomer in here that's being compressed and coming back. And on the right, we have Daniel. And when Daniel gets excited, he extends and his dynamic back compresses 
and when he relaxes, he returns to a more upright position, and he is also using dynamic foot rests. So let's talk a little bit more about determining resistance. If a dynamic back is too firm, regardless of whether we're using elastomers, springs, or hydraulics, the client will not be able to activate the back at all. So you might place this dynamic back on the wheelchair frame and notice that there's just no movement. It's time to change to a softer level of resistance. If the resistance is too soft, then you might notice that the chair is, or the dynamic back is engaging simply by tilting the chair or if a backpack is placed on the back canes. If this is happening, you may need to choose a firmer re uh, level of resistance. If the client can move the back but cannot return to upright, the resistance is too low for them. Or in the case of the seating dynamics uh, hardware here, if you notice that these two pieces of metal are touching each other, that means that this elastomer here is too soft for that individual. Uh, the seating dynamics dynamic rocker back comes with, again, four elastomers. Uh, it comes with Clear, which is the default, which is medium. Yellow is soft, blue, firm, and green, extra firm. This elastomer pictured on the far left is called a rebound elastomer. So within this mechanism is actually two different elastomers. The primary elastomer, which absorbs force from the client, and then there's a secondary elastomer hiding in here to help the client return to upright smoothly. The elastomers will need to be checked at least once a year because they can get worn out. And you know, that's really their job. Their job is to wear out rather than you having breakage of the wheelchair frame itself. So long-term forces will compress and deform that elastomer. Here on the far left, we have a picture of a standard new elastomer. And on um, the left side of this picture, we have one that has been really quite worn. So the extreme forces from the client have taken this very firm material and done this to it. That's how much force has been averted from the frame itself. And if you look in the center here, you can see that old elastomer. It kind of looks like a bulging disc, and that lets you know, yep, we're getting a little too worn out. And here on the far right, it's been replaced with a new elastomer, a green one. It's a little firmer to help this from not occurring so readily, but also you can see we have a proper distance here between these two components. The back is no longer sagging because a new elastomer has been installed. Stealth Products also has a dynamic backrest mounting hardware, and this is designed specifically to be used with a linear back. So you might recognize this hardware here. It's very commonly used to mount a back like this to the back canes. But in this case, where this knob is, there's actually a spring inside there that allows the back to move back ever so slightly, not very much. And the entire mechanism is encased so that dirt and grime doesn't get in there either. This is not designed to provide a lot of movement for the client. It is designed to protect the hardware from breakage. Stealth Products also has the Tarda back, and this provides quite a bit of dynamic, dynamic movement. This is typically used by someone who is a more active user. And you can see here that someone could reach to the side, reach back, and have that support as they do so because the back will move with them. You can change the height of this as well if someone needs support higher up on the spine. So it's off the shelf, but you can customize it. You can choose the shape of this spine and then provide the amount of flex that this person needs. Uh, it's made in Italy. It's available in the US from Stealth Products. The matrix seating system is uh, similar to a molded seating system. It's aggressively uh, contoured seat. And you can loosen each of these various uh, discs to move them into a precise position to capture the contours of an individual client. 
there are some X's between these hubs that can be replaced with a flexible one. So the gray ones are firm, but these uh, red ones you see have some flex. So a little bit of movement can be built into this seating system to absorb some shocks, provide a little flexibility. So not a lot of movement, but it does provide those options. Sunrise Medical has their dynamic back that is available on some of the quickie power and manual wheelchairs. It's available on their mono back that you see here or the dual cane back. It does lock out. Uh, it is a dynamic option that needs to be requested, and there are four levels of resistance available on this. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with the Sunrise option is the pivot point is rather low, and so some clients may have a loss of position of the pelvis upon return to upright. All right, next we move on to dynamic footrests. So dynamic footrests can provide movement in multiple directions. They can telescope downward, elevate at the knee, provide movement at the ankle into dorsi and plantar flexion, and the foot plates can rotate outward. Again, we can combine dynamic footrests with other dynamic options at the hip and the head as appropriate to provide a more uh, universal approach. Just depends on the client and where that movement tends to initiate. Many of our clients who push with great force against their foot plates lift their entire body out of their seating system and often straighten the body. There's a lot of knee and hip extension. This removes that leverage and can be very, very powerful for our clients. The telescoping downward movement can be helpful for clients who have very tight hamstrings and may lack range to elevate their knee very far. By combining the telescoping movement with knee extension, if the client has adequate range, we follow that more natural arcing movement of the knee. This is a complex movement and hard to capture. Some clients, when they extend, also tend to extend at the ankle, pointing their toes down to the floor, and that's why we sometimes want that option to capture and allow that movement at the ankle. If you're working with a client who's wearing orthotics on their ankle, such as AFOs, then we don't need this option because that movement will not be available. And footrest rotating outward is something that may accommodate some uh, tibial torsion if the feet need to be positioned in an outward pos um, posture. But this rotation is sometimes designed to protect the chair from damage if the edge of the footrest or foot plate contacts a doorway. Now we have a lot less product options when it comes to dynamic footrests, but these include Miller's and Seating Dynamics. So Miller's has this dynamic footrest coil and it's been available for some time. It fits in between the upper portion of the footrest hanger and the lower portion. It is designed not to go up and down, even though it looks like it. This does not provide a telescoping movement, but rather a rotational movement. So it allows for some rotation at the foot plate. And the main reason for this, again, is if a client is moving through a doorway, for example, and the edge corner here of the foot plate collides with that doorway, instead of everything losing position or breaking, this coil takes and absorbs that force. So this again is not designed so much to absorb client force, but rather external force. They have a specialized coil for PDG chairs and they have um, another option here where we can also provide this underneath the foot plate and this provides for some plantar and dorsi flexion from the client as they push downward on the edge of this foot plate. 
Miller's also has their dynamic footrest gas spring, and this is designed to provide only telescoping movement. It will move downward about two inches. Whenever we use these telescoping options, it's important to make sure there's adequate ground clearance underneath the footplate to allow for this movement. Again, two inches in this case. There's a gas spring and it provides three different levels of resistance. Now you do have to choose a gas spring ahead of time and determine which one do you think is required for your individual client. This is a newer product from uh, Miller's. The Miller's dynamic articulating footrest hanger has been around for a while. I'm not sure if it will be around a lot longer because they do have some newer products. There are four different levels of resistance by choosing a specific gas spring. So if you see my cursor here, that's the gas hydraulic right there. This telescopes and elevates at the knee, and that's very important to follow the natural arc of the lower leg. This is someone demonstrating it. I have had some challenges personally with this product with some of my clients because the pivot point is rather low uh, from where the knee extends. So some of my clients are not able to activate this component, although they are extending. This is their newer version, and this is their dynamic articulating leg with extension device. So this also telescopes downward and then swings upward, but it's a uh, less bulky and again, just newer design. And uh, I have not had an opportunity to try this one myself, but I think it uh, will most likely work a little more smoothly than its predecessor that we just saw. The seating dynamics, dynamic footrest, telescopes, and has an optional knee extension, optional dynamic dorsi plantar flexion, depending on what your client needs. So if we only use the telescoping feature, this telescope is about an inch and a half. Again, we have to make sure there's enough ground clearance to support that. There are three different springs that come with the dynamic footrest so that you can change it right in the field if you need to, to accommodate your client's resistance needs. This is good to use alone for clients who have really tight hamstrings and who really can't extend at the knee or who, if attempting to extend at the knee, end up pulling their pelvis forward into a posterior pelvic tilt. Those hamstrings tend to get tight and they're connected to the pelvis and the knee. So if we extend at the knee and the client has insufficient range, they will slide into a posterior pelvic tilt because that's where the other end of the hamstring is connected. So might be good for those clients. We can also add on knee extension. And again, that combination of telescoping and elevation at the knee follows more of the natural arc of the leg um, at the knee. And we can add on a dynamic dorsi plantar flexion if that is indicated for that individual. Most people are going to move into plantar flexion. They're going to push downward with their toes as they extend throughout their body. And this will move in up to 10 degrees in each direction. Here on the left, we'll see a demonstration of the dynamic footrest. And you can see all three movements here, knee extension, telescoping, and plantar flexion. On the right, Spencer is showing us how he is able to move these foot plates depending on what's happening with his tone. He has a high pivot option here and that places the pivot point at a better spot for him to activate these. One of the things I like about using dynamic foot plates that are separate like this is that if a client has more tone on one side of their body than the other at that moment in time, just that leg will move. We might have clients that move both or only one leg at a time. Some of our older dynamic seating options used a foot board and if the client tended to extend more with one side of their body, that board didn't always respond to that. These individual foot plates do a good job of that. 
So let's talk about that resistance again. Using the seating dynamics, dynamic footrests as an example, these come with three different types of springs. One is a default, and that's the medium one. These are rated by a certain amount of pounds, 20 pounds for yellow, 40 pounds for blue, 60 pounds for green. But keep in mind that this does not relate to the client's weight. It relates to the client's force. So try out the default. And if it doesn't seem to work, you could try a softer or firmer level of resistance. If the resistance is too firm with that default, you'll notice the client isn't activating the mechanism and you may need to swap to something softer. Even a client who has very, very high force may surprise you and require a lower amount of resistance. If it's too soft, the client may telescope or elevate that footrest and then not readily return. Now the springs are used in the telescoping mechanism. So at this time in determining which spring to use, we're considering only that telescoping movement. So if we're not seeing the telescoping movement at all, try a softer spring. If the client is moving and not readily returning, try a firmer spring. You can also use a different level of resistance on each side because many of our clients do tend to extend, use more force on one side of their body than the other. And fortunately, these springs don't wear out really easy. It's uh, pretty rare for these to need replacement. The knee extension is addressed with elastomers and you can see those pictured here. And the default is blue, which is firm. And there's only one other option, and that is a softer option as needed. So if this is too firm, we'll see that there's no movement into knee extension. And you can swap these out with the yellow elastomers. If the yellow elastomers are too soft, you might see movement again into knee extension, but not that the client is able to readily return to a neutral starting point. I am surprised how many clients I work with who have been constantly moving their foot plates out of position or actually breaking their footrest hangers who simply don't need a great deal of resistance in this telescoping or extension movement. Some of them do, but I have clients who absolutely have spent years standing on their foot plates and do not always need a lot of resistance here because we're simply taking away that leverage and they just can't extend against a moving target. The resistance should be checked periodically because if the knee starts extending too readily, it might simply mean that the elastomers need to be replaced. And then finally, we have plantar and dorsiflexion. There are elastomers in here. They are not really designed to be changed for resistance. There's not usually that much force in this area because so much has already been diffused further up the line. Uh, but they can be changed if needed. Uh, there's not an option to change the resistance on the plantar dorsiflexion. We then move to dynamic head support hardware. Now we have a couple options here. We have movement that can occur in a bi-directional pattern back and forth. We have movement that can occur in a multi-directional pattern and this can capture rotation. And it's very important that no matter how the component is designed to capture force from the client, that the client is not moving into neck hyperextension. Neck hyperextension increases the risk of aspiration. It makes a uh, swallow less safe. It can impact breathing and it certainly impacts vision. So we want to capture neck extension without allowing the client to move into neck hyperextension if at all possible. Again, we can combine this with dynamic seating at the hips and at the knees as appropriate. So here are all the companies, and there's a lot of them, who make a dynamic seating option at the head. We usually refer to these as dynamic head support hardware because this hardware can be used with a variety of head pads, depending again on an individual need. 
Sometimes these manufacturers will only be compatible with their own line of head pads. Other manufacturers work with a number of different manufacturers head pads. So for example, if you're ordering a Stealth Products head support pad, you can use that with dynamic hardware from Stealth. You can also use it with dynamic hardware from some of these other manufacturers, such as Seating Dynamics. So let's start with Metalcraft. Metalcraft has been around for a long time and they have a pretty good variety of head pads. They came up with this dynamic option that moves posteriorly one and three quarters inches, depending on if the client can move it that far. And there are three levels of resistance, and this is done by a spring. This is bi-directional. It goes back, it goes forward. If the client has a lot of rotation, as they are attempting to activate this, sometimes the mechanism will jam and will not respond to that client's force. So it's important to keep that in mind. Miller's has two main options. This is their dynamic headrest interface, and it uses a gas spring. We can see it back here. It has four levels of resistance. One of my concerns with this is it provides a very large amount of movement. Now, this person demonstrating this obviously is able to move this quite a distance. The person who is sitting in the chair should not be able to move it that far unless they don't have their pelvic belt on. And then perhaps they could. And we don't want our client to injure themselves. So important to keep that in mind. Uh, this particular dynamic headrest also locks out. Not all of them do. So this can be locked out for transportation. It is not crash tested, but it can be locked out as desired. This is Miller's other option, and it's called the dynamic headrest horizontal adjustment bar. You can see that this moves, oh, let me get that started again, in a bi-directional way again, like that metal craft one. Also, you can see there's a shroud here that's designed to cover this spring. One of the challenges with head support hardware is hair. So if you have a client whose hair is long enough to get into these springs, you can imagine as this moves back and forth that that hair can get caught and pulled. Despite this shroud, some of the clients I've worked with who have this particular dynamic component have a lot of hair in that spring. So it is a consideration when we're looking at this hardware to make sure we're not causing hair to be pulled out. That doesn't feel good. Uh, we don't want that to happen. So this moves posteriorly about two inches. And I'm going to go back for just a second here as opposed to, here we go, this one again where uh, this does not move solely posteriorly, but follows more of an arcing movement. So a unique movement pattern here. Miller's more recently has come out with this lateral tracking headrest device. So there is again a spring here, it's covered by a shroud, and it will allow some lateral movement. Now, I have not had a chance to meet this product in person yet, so I think it is multi-directional, but I would need to see. But I believe this spring is designed to move laterally, so if a client is pushing against the side of the head pad, the headrest will still respond with movement, but I do not believe there's a lot of uh, posterior movement on this, more of that lateral capturing rotational movement. Seating Dynamics has a dynamic headrest and they have two versions, a single axis and a multi-axis. The single axis will only go posteriorly, directly back. The multi-axis will move to capture rotation. Both of these will move about 10 degrees, but it does depend on what elastomers you're using, how much resistance there is, and how many of these links you've added. You can see we have a number of links so that you can choose the height of the head support. Well, the longer this leverage point is, the farther the client will be able to move the head support. 
Now I have found that clients that I work with who are using the single axis version of this, if they rotate their head while pushing backwards into extension, will still activate this dynamic component. So the movement, the force is still accommodated. What about determining resistance again? Well, this, uh, this particular dynamic headrest from seating dynamics comes standard with blue resistance that's firm, but it also ships with extra firm as needed. So if you find that that additional resistance is required, you can go ahead and change that out in the field. If things are too firm, you might notice the client really is not activating the dynamic component. If the resistance is too low, you may notice there's a little too much extraneous head movement or movement into neck hyperextension. Again, the more links, adding more height, the more leverage. We then have the stealth tone deflector, and this can be placed behind any of the stealth head pads. Some of their head supports have two different levels. In this case, we have someone moving the suboccipital level. There's usually an occipital pad over that. You can choose which of those levels you want to add the tone deflector to. Generally, you're not going to put it on both. So this is about the size of a hockey puck, and inside are some elastomers, and those are designed to absorb some of this force. It will move about 10 degrees in any direction. In this video, uh, Gabe here is able to move it further than that because he has a lot of leverage, but typically the client isn't going to move it that much. I have a lot of clients who don't look like they're moving it at all, but because the forces are being absorbed, may no longer break their head supports. So this works well for clients who may not tolerate a larger degree of movement, but we still need to protect hardware. For some clients, if the head moves rearward past a certain point, it can set off some undesirable results. We may see an increase in extension. We may see a startle reaction. We may see postural insecurity or other reflexive responses. If that's what's happening, but we really need to protect the hardware, then we can go ahead and use something like this that only provides minimal movement. Symmetric Designs has some nice head supports and they have more recently come up with this Dynamic Plus hardware and you can see it here. It can be locked out and there's a spring mechanism that you can swap out to be firm or soft. And it's an option on one of their hardware mounting options, the Twin Headrest hardware. So again, can be locked out uh, by turning this knob here. You can change the spring. It moves in a bi-directional manner. Symmetric, Symmetric Designs also has the Axion rotary interface, and this has been available for some time. It's shown on the right in this video with their um, uh, particular headrest the, uh, that works really well, the Savant uh, headrest. And you can see on the Savant headrest, this person has the forehead strap on. So if we have to strap someone's head to their head support in order to keep their head in position, we can still allow some movement in this rotation uh, pattern here without the client losing their head forward. So this person can still turn side to side to visually regard their environment. And this is often used by people with diagnoses such as ALS. There is a little friction knob on here. I'm gonna to point to it here with my cursor that can add resistance or lock out the mechanism completely. And you can order this to allow either 30 degrees of movement in each direction or 45 degrees of movement in each direction. So again, the Axion, you do not have to use it with the Savant, but it is often used with the Savant with the forehead strap. Whitmire, which is under the Sunrise Medical umbrella, has the flex interface bracket. It provides movement upward and then back to neutral. 
The challenge is that the way this is designed to move moves into neck hyperextension and that's something that we generally want to avoid with our clients. But this is a dynamic option that is available. It has something called elastomeric bushings and there's a choice of hard and soft on these so you can choose the level of resistance for an individual. And then we have the head pod. Now the head pod is a very unique intervention. It was originally designed not as a head positioning system, but as a therapeutic device. It was designed to use with young children to improve their head control and it works. It works very well and you can see some of that in this video here. But people did start using this on wheelchairs and other seating systems. So this young lady here is wearing a visor that's purely for aesthetic purposes, but there are some bands on her head and to the band is attached this little plastic ladder piece that attaches to a rod that's suspended above the client's head and attaches to the rear of the head support or of the chair. Uh, in the video, you can see there's a band across the forehead and across the top of the head. So the head is basically suspended allowing the client to still turn their head, work their neck muscles so that head control can be improved, but keep the head in an upright position. So this is being used more and more within wheelchair seating systems. I think it's very important to make sure that we carefully assess a client because a client with this degree of head control or lack thereof is not going to have a lot of stability around the cervical vertebrae. Want to make sure this client cannot be injured. So we've covered a lot of information. We talked about a definition of dynamic seating. We talked about the main goals of dynamic seating clinical indicators of this intervention, and then product options for dynamic backs, dynamic footrests, dynamic head support hardware. I hope this has been helpful to you. We have also provided a number of reference materials for you along with this recorded course, so please refer to those. There are also additional references on the Seating Dynamics website, and these include the brand new Resna position paper on the application of dynamic seating, which includes an exhaustive literature review, <laughs> as well as extensive clinical indicators from a work group that uh, worked on that paper. It also includes a number of blogs on a variety of topics related to dynamic seating, case studies, a literature review that is separate from the literature review within the position paper, uh, clinical guidelines for various applications of seating dynamic, uh, dynamic seating, whether it's from seating dynamics or other companies, uh, funding resources, including some sample letters of medical necessity and sample wording to justify these various interventions and a variety of on-demand education that you can access. And you can find all of that at seatingdynamics.com. So I want to thank you very much for joining us here today and make sure that you have my contact information as well as contact information for New Motion and for Seating Dynamics who has sponsored this course here today. Again, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments and thanks so much for joining us here for this course on dynamic seating.